How you doing, Eddie? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. That sounds a whole lot more glamorous than it really is, I assure you. <laughs> well, I mean, the experience still, it, it, it speaks volume because you've done a lot of deals and you've been a part of a lot of transactions and you've also done it over an extended period of time. So a lot of folks have been gotten in this industry since 2012-ish uh, when things started to turn around. And from that point until COVID, there hasn't been a lot of major interruptions. It's been a pretty good tailwind run. Um, so the market we're in now is kind of the first heavy headwinds we've really seen on a just a Mac. I'm speaking residential here on a macro basis. Um, so that's kind of the context that I want to have here. And just a quick backstory. I met you, Eddie. Um, it, it, it was around that time. Uh, mm -hmm. Things were pulling out. It was actually it was around 2010. Things were starting to turn around in Houston. And uh, I was networking on Craigslist. I don't know if people go on Craigslist <laughs> anymore, but I was looking for, uh, I was building my buyer's list. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to build your buyer's list. And uh, I reached out to some deal you had and you were like, hey, I own a hard money company. And uh, you ended up funding my uh, my wife and I, our, our very first deal in Houston that we did. Uh, you funded several of those first ones. And uh, you know, you've been a, a great partner um, in, in various, you know, ventures and events and uh you know the deals and your um your events locally and everything you've done um you've been a really good part of the community so i appreciate it and i'm hoping you pay us off on that loan someday real soon one one of these days i promise <laughs> one dollar a month I think I bought several houses from you, Chris. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've also, so I, I've never done a lot of wholesale deals just because I, I like the confidence of um, I close and then you the double close. But um, you, you're one of the few that I've always been confident. You've got the cash uh, and then you can close. So, yeah, I've whole, uh, wholesaled a few deals to you. Hopefully yeah. they did all right. Yeah. You know, you mentioned, you know, the uh, 2008, 2009, 2010 time frame a little bit and then you – mentioned COVID a little bit. Yeah, the, the big thing now is uh, one word, interest rates. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we're, we got higher rates than we did back then. Um, it's it's kind of insane. I mean, th there's a whole era of investors who they don't know anything other than interest rates falling. And all of a sudden, that's not happening anymore. They're going in the opposite direction at rapid pace. So, um so this is a Q&A session. If, if you got a question for Eddie, drop it in the chat. Now I'm monitoring, right now I'm, on, I'm monitoring the YouTube chat. So if you drop a question there, I'm gonna see it. If you drop it somewhere else, I'm not saying I won't see it. It's just harder for me to see. Um, but in any case, I'm gonna kick it off here. You know, How have you adjusted your exit strategies going in on deals um, you know, over the last say, say 12 months or so? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to say it's probably more about price point presentation than anything. And when, when you say an adjustment, you know, we, we were all trained in this business and, and rightfully so to look at sales data, sales data, sales data, sales data. Now, what we look at as much as anything is actives and pendings, where they are, that ratio of actives to pendings. I'll give a, a quick, totally opposite of the spectrum examples. Let's say you're you're looking at a, a half a mile circle or, or your subdivision and you see 28 actives and one pending. Well, that's going to tell you real quick, they're not moving very well. And then the other example on the other end of the spectrum B, there's, there's, there's 14 actives and there's nine pendings, you know, very different data. So we're looking at actives and pendings harder than we've ever looked before, because when I buy a house today, yes, I'm looking at sales data, but I'm looking at the actives. What am I competing with tomorrow when I close on this house? What, what, where's my competition? So we're going to, we're going to use that data for our ARV as much so, if not more than we're using sales data. Does that make sense what I'm saying, Chris? No, 100 percent I mean, sales data, that's that's data from yesterday. And yesterday, now I'm thinking usually when you go back and look at comps, appraisers, they'll use six months, but the market six months ago is nothing like it is today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even 90 days, it's different. So right. 
I'll kind of share what I've done and then you can let me know if you do the same thing or if you do something different, but I usually go back 90 days. I'll go back 180 days. I'll look at things, but then I'm going back 90 days, 60 days, 30 days. I'm seeing what is that trend looking like? And that data, especially in a market that has changed so rapidly, the closer you can get in the next 30, 45 days, that's a lot more accurate than things 180 days ago. Um, and then of course you got to still calculate in the pendings and actives. Mm -hmm. Well, th that's right. And, 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 and I, I look at all of those. I, I look at 90, 180, 240, 360. I, I really do. Um, but, but let's take another example. Let's say you, you evaluate sales data alone and you come up with an ARV. This house should sell for 320, but then you go look at the actives and you got 14 actives in there and they're all scattered from 260 to 300. Well, that 320 doesn't make a whole lot of sense anymore, does it? You know, you better not use 320 as your ARV to, to buy that property. You better be using the lower end of those actives because that's really what you're going to compete with tomorrow. And that's what we do. And we do it more now than we ever have in the past. Yeah. Yeah. And you've been a big proponent of driving the comps too. Um, so I, I imagine that also includes driving those actives and seeing how your, 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 your property stacks up. That's right. hundred percent. I mean, even today after, you know, and my number is actually around 1850 uh, deals purchased now. And even with that in 23 years, I still go drive the comps. You have to, I mean, why, why would you not drive the comps? You're going to, you're going to discover a little bit more about your market that you didn't know that you might've thought you knew until you drive your comps. Yeah. So um, th th this question comes from the, uh, the chat here. Can bad market conditions give opportunity to close profitable real estate deals in the long run? Well, the short answer is yes. Uh, and then you expand upon that. Um, you know, and, and we talked about this a lot whenever the market was a feeding frenzy for sellers. It was a hot seller market. 2019, 2018 through 21. I mean, it's never been hotter to sell a house, but it was a little more difficult to buy. I remember being on stage every night. We talked about what if the market changes, what if the market changes, and everybody was, you know, a little nervous about it. Was there's really no need to be nervous. You just you very simply um, change your strategy based on market conditions. You know, it's it's still not a a bad seller's market, sales are down 30, 33, 34%, depending on which article you read, but inventory is not growing. So that's keeping it reasonable around here to be able to sell your houses. Um, you would think inventory would grow uh, when sales are down so much, but they're not. And I'll tell you why in a minute, but um, you just adjust your strategy in short, the simple strategy is you need to pay less for these houses right now. You really do. Um, the market has slowed down. You have to, you have to pay less. You can pay less and keep this in mind. Everybody on this call, real estate investors, for the most part, we all know this, but the general public doesn't know it yet. I have found that when a, the market changes in a, in a, in a moderate to big way, that the general public, there's a lag time. And, and honestly, I think we're in that lag time right now. The general public, I still talk to too many sellers that call in for my marketing and they're not quite up to speed yet of what's going on in the market. They'll eventually get there. So uh, just keep that in mind as you're out making, making offers today. Love it. So um, if you were to buy a deal um, you know, in, in the chat, Andrew mentions a bad deal, um, but we'll, we'll just call it a deal that's not selling as you anticipated. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you're going to strongly consider alternative exit strategies, like maybe just renting that thing out and riding it out or throwing sellers financing on top of it to, um, uh, to as you called inventory control back in the day? Yeah, you know, I, I need to, I guess, revive that 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 phrase that I used to say all the time the well Chris that's exactly what we did in 08 9 and 10 um, you know we really didn't start to pop out of that till 11 
but we were buying a whole lot more houses than we could sell the normal way. And I've said this forever, that if you get yourself into a bad deal, there's really only two ways to get out of it without getting hurt monetarily. And that is you rent your way out of it or you note your way out of it. Rent your way out. That's pretty simple. You turn it into a into a, a, a you know a long term hold and you rent it. And we need to talk about interest rates for that uh, on this call. And the other thing is you note it out, meaning you own or finance it. And that's a little more in depth, you know, to really talk all the way through owner finance is really it's almost a two day conversation. And I'm not exaggerating that there's so many considerations that you got to go through to be able to to correctly owner finance a house. But yeah, you can owner finance one and you can learn how to do it in about three minutes. But to learn how to do it right is a long process. So I, I've always said this, the the biggest the biggest parameter and your owner financing is where did the money come from to acquire the property? Where did it come from? Was it your cash? Was it somebody else's cash? Was it short-term financing? Was it long-term financing? Where did that money come from? And that's, that's your biggest parameter that you got to consider, in my opinion, if you're going to exit via an owner finance, a seller finance note. But there's no better thing out there to get you out of a bad deal into a better deal long term than the rental, in my opinion. One um, and I, I've had to do that on several occasions where we bought a house and it maybe we made some mistakes on the comps um, or repairs just, mm -hmm. you know, ran over budget and mm -hmm. we ended up having to rent them out. Mm -hmm. And uh, on almost every occasion, time does its thing, um, especially in the strong market we were in. It may take longer to do that in the coming markets. We don't know. But uh, we were able to rent it out. We sold two of them this year. We sold two of them for profit. In, in, in simple terms for the guys that's maybe guys and ladies that's not as experienced is, so how does renting get you out of it? Well, number one, appreciation over time. Yeah. Okay. Number two, uh, pay down of the mortgage debt. So basically, hopefully you're at least breaking even on your rent and your payment. So your, your rent payment uh, goes to pay down, pay the debt, which is paying the mortgage down and uh, appreciation. We're not going to get great appreciation this year, but we're going to get it again. We just don't know exactly when that's going to be. If you take, you know, the three years of 2019, 2020, 2021, the, the three years combined in, in, in Texas, you know, was basically 40% appreciation to low 40%, depending on which data you want to read. You know, it's it's 40 to 44 percent over a three year period. That's a heck of a gain in your rental portfolio. We will see that again. It's not going to be 2023, but we're going to see it again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to get back to that. But one other question uh, <laughs> you'll like um, when he says drive your comps, do you literally mean drive your comps? Yeah, you go look at them. You drive uh, by and look at them. And from share, the, share exactly. Or, you know, wh wh what is the primary benefit that you're driving your comps versus just looking on the MLS, looking at the street? You're verifying that that comps data is is similar to your subject property. Huh. Okay. You, you know, you or, or non similar. You thought it was a good comp. Now it's not because you're, you think your property is worth. 300,000 and you got this cop just right around the corner for 420 and you're going, wow, I, I might be able to get 420 for that. And you drive over there and it's got a 40 by 60 brand new metal building sitting in the backyard. You know, that's, that's probably a really good example that you may not know had that. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a game changer for that, for that, cop you, you can't use the 420 anymore because it's got a 40 by 60 metal building sitting in the backyard that you didn't know about yeah and especially in, in, in markets like houston where there's no zoning laws and one street over can be the same neighborhood but night and day difference in um in curb appeal um and then there's the neighbors what do the neighbors look like mm -hmm. if uh, your neighbors aren't quite the same as their neighbors that's going to have an impact 
it's verification. I guess if I had to pick one word of why you drive a comp, yeah. it's verification. You're verifying. You're, you're verifying that your your data supports what you think it supports. Yeah. So, um, how do you think appreciation is going to play out over, say, 24, 25? Most economists right now are are calling for the rest of this year to be pretty flat. Yeah. And then maybe pulling in, pulling out a little higher next year. It's, it's not going to be like it, like it has been. But what, what are your thoughts? Well, I can tell you this about 2024. I'm I'm not going to sit here and absolutely tell you what's going to happen. I can tell you what I think is going to happen, but I'll guarantee you this one. The market's going to be different in 2024 than it is now. I guarantee you. We're going to be sitting here next year, late 2024, staring at an election, and we're going to be talking about how it was in 2023, and oh my goodness, look where we are now. Because it's like that all the time. Every year or every few years, you get a you get a you get a pretty good change. Some of it more drastic than others, but I the biggest thing I think is going to happen for 2024, and it's all going to be election driven. Is I think, and most of the economists put this in in writing, is they believe interest rates are going to drop due to Washington's going to force interest rates down going into the election. That's what the general consensus is out there, how it affects appreciation. You know, I'll say this, in 19, 20, and 21, you heard every day about the housing demand, that there was an undersupply of housing. Well, these the sales slowed down and sales have decreased due to interest rates. The lack of housing has, that, that, that has not gone away. There's still more demand than there are houses. That's the, one of the reasons that the builders are so, are so hot right now. The reason inventory is staying low is simple. 85% um, of all home mortgages today in the United States, and I'm talking mortgages for homestead owners, people that live in that house, 85% of those mortgages are 5% or less in interest rate. 65% or 4% or less. So you, and it is very well documented that there's a, a record low of new listings coming on board and it's due to all of these people are in low interest rates um, are not gonna move that house with that sitting there with that four, four and a half percent interest rate. It's just not gonna happen. So there's still a housing demand. The the people that are benefiting the most right now is the is the new construction um the problem therein lies affordability because interest rates are high and you can't go buy a new built house for two hundred thousand. but mm -hmm. i can buy an old house in pasadena and remodel it and put fifty thousand in it and sell it for two hundred thousand. so you get this totally out of whack affordability issue going on and it gets very complex but i know i'm getting long-winded here but appreciation will be back we just don't know when I think everybody thinks interest rates are going to fall the second half of 2024, which is going to happen on sales. Yeah. So it seems like we hear some folks are calling for a housing crash or a collapse in housing prices. Um, it's not as many as I, I used to hear, but I still see it and they still seem to be very loud and proud about um, that opinion. It seems like you're, not necessarily thinking that is likely. Well, I think supply and demand will keep us out of that. I really do. You got to understand some of these articles you read are they're trying to get a click because they get paid a penny every time somebody hits that button. You got, I, and this is no exaggeration. It's almost every week. I'll read National Mortgage News article. There is a huge inventory of foreclosures on the way. And I'm telling you, about three or four o'clock in the afternoon, you'll see another national headline by someone else, or it could be national mortgage news again saying, you know, the foreclosure rate is less than 1% right now. The lowest has been in years and they're, they're trying to get you to click. So you have to be careful in what you, what you read out there. I don't think supply and demand would allow the possibility you mentioned, Chris, because there's still high uh, demand and low supply, especially in Texas. You know, 
Texas is growing at 2% a year. You know, last year, people don't realize this, but we went over 30 million people in Texas now. And, and, and we gained another 600,000 people in Texas last year. And it's going to happen again this year. Uh, it's kind of hard to have a housing crash when you got 600,000 people moving to your state every year. And one of the key elements of life is shelter, meaning yeah. a house. So what do you say to folks? I mean, you go to a lot of, a lot of events. What do you say to folks that, that, that say they just want us, they want to stay liquid right now for, uh, a good buying opportunity when houses go on sale? Well, I think it's smart to stay liquid all the time, <laughs> you know, regardless of the year. Uh, that's, that's, I've always said this, as long as you're liquid, you can't get in trouble. Uh, so, but, but I, I know what you're saying. You know, I don't think I've ever met a real estate investor who's been successful and been in it a while who said one or two, of, one or one of these comments, you know, I just, I wish I would have got started a little later. I, I wish I would have started in 2010. I wish I would have waited 2015. I don't, I don't think you ever hear that. I don't think you ever hear a, a landlord or an investor that's bought hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of houses ever say, you know, I wish I would have bought a few less. I wish I wouldn't have bought as many. You never hear that. So it's in my opinion, and, it, and I'm not trying to sell books or tapes here. You know, there's there's never really a bad time to get into real estate investing. It's just different strategies at the point in time that you enter. Yeah. Now, uh, a lot of folks actually say that say the opposite. Those who have been in the industry for long enough, it's I wish I bought more. I certainly say that. I mean, I, I ring, yeah. I ring my bell when I say, "Hey, we yeah. flipped 200 houses." But really, and all honesty, I'd, I would rather say, "Hey, we bought 50 and we held them all." I'm sad I flipped 200 houses. I wish we kept them all. I, I'll use two examples there. Uh, uh, when Allison moved through here in 01 and flooded us so bad, I was scared to death. I thought, "Man, you can't go buy all these flood houses. It's going to be a glut." I bought about 15. When it was all said and done, I should have bought 115. Yeah. Okay. And I remember that lesson when Ike rolled around, but still I had a hard time. No, not Ike, um, Harvey. I had a hard time convincing myself to go buy a ton of them. So I bought a lot of them, but I didn't buy as many as I could have reflecting back on it. I probably should have bought a lot more as long as I stayed out of Meyerland. Cause that's really the one of only two areas of the city that has a <laughs> really fully it's Meyerland. The other one is a little bit West Memorial, but, uh, yeah but, but, but anyway the point being you know as long as you buy where you need to be buying with the with the um, appropriate amount of discount what i call equity capture when you purchase it you know you you as long as you do those things and do them wisely you'll be okay yeah it all comes down to having risk mitigated returns, knowing what, what you want, what your goals are, knowing your market and how is this particular property going to, um, going to meet those goals. And then I like to also throw in multiple exit strategies. So yeah. if you can't sell it, you can rent it. Then at a bare minimum, hopefully just break even. Yeah. And, and I'll say this, I mean, there's so many new and young investors and they get, they get really nervous and really scared and, I maybe scared is a strong word. They get really just, should they do it? Should they not do it? And, and I'll give this plug for jet landing. And it's really some of my other friends uh, that loan money in Houston. If you don't know if your deal is a deal, or if you don't know whether you should or shouldn't, man, you just take that deal to a hard money lender. And you're going to know real quick whether you should buy it or not, because yep. hard money lenders willing to give you, 100% financing or close to 100% financing, uh, you can pretty well rest assured you probably got yourself a good deal. Yeah. And I'll turn the flip on that if your hard money lender tells you, uh, don't do it or you're going to have to put a whole bunch of money down to, to do the deal with us. That's probably a clue that maybe your deal is not as, as good as you might like. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, no, 100%. So ultimately, the hard money lender wants, they want you to be successful. They want you to come back, borrow more money. If you're a one and done because you lost money, that doesn't really help their uh, their long-term acquisition, <laughs> uh, long-term value of, of a customer. So 
by getting that feedback, which as far as I know, all of them will do that for free. That's right. By getting that feedback, that's invaluable because they look at not just five deals a week or five deals a month. They're looking at 10, 20, 50 a day or a well, week. Right. Um, and and they've got that market excellence, that market knowledge. I'm sorry. I, I, and I know all the hard money. And I say I know them all. I think I know them all. All the hard money lenders in, in Houston. 98% of them are good people. They're good guys. They'll, they'll, they'll help you. I put us in that category. But that's a, that's a surefire way to know if your deal's a deal or not. Yeah. And really, if, if, if it's your first few investors, you, you should be using a hard money lender. Probably. Probably. So there's so many benefits. You know. there, there's just, yeah, the getting the feedback from someone who's done that many deals. And also, they're going to know the vendors, who to recommend for insurance, who to recommend for title. Mm -hmm to recommend for contractors like y'all um jet you know recommending contractors just hvac alone when i was going i remember i got a bid for eighteen thousand dollars and re replacing hvac back in 2011 <laughs> and i was astounded that it cost that much but i had no other knowledge that that was odd and then i got a second quote it was twelve thousand. now i'm thinking sweet i just saved a lot of money mm -hmm. and then jet's project manager uh said no no give this guy a call i think we paid five yeah. <laughs> I went from 18 to 12 and I was about to pull the trigger in 12 and paid five. Well, well, that's exactly right. I mean, it's such a learning curve out there. And, you know, I, I'll say this, you know, we, we all go to a lot of events and, and, and sometimes I sit in there and I listen to whoever's on the stage and speaking, but you know, where I find myself more often than not is talking to, talking to vendors. You know, I want to go talk to the roofer, you know, I want to go talk to the, you know, to the electrician, you know, I want to go talk to those guys. They're, that's where the knowledge is when you go to the event. Yeah. Speaking of which, how do you find, uh, other than just networking events, how do you really find the quality um, or how do you vet quality contractors? Because that, that's really, from a flipping business, that's, in my opinion, the most challenging part of the entire flipping process is managing contractors. It's, it's yeah, I, I think it is. Um, you know, it's, it's, to me, when I'm looking for a new contractor, I start calling buddies. I start calling friends. I start calling people in the industry say, hey, <coughs> I need a such and such contractor. Who you got? You know, here, here, here's one you're always looking for. I need a foundation guy that works on blocking beam. Okay. You I mean, you, you're always looking for that guy. So I call my buddies and, and, quiz the all right who you got who have you used you know who's good and you you'll normally get you'll normally get end up with two or three or four and at the meetings ask you know you, you really shouldn't go to a new meeting or go to a meeting unless you're going to engage uh with at least 10 people and i'd, I'd even say more than that 15 to 20 that you mm -hmm. have the potential to do business with later yeah, yeah don't just go stand over there and at the beer line you know yeah yeah you got you got you got to start talking to some people and meet them <laughs> and find people you can do business with this was my strategy because i'm an introvert so um 10 15 people that it, it's a it's a challenge for me but um i would in in the beginning i would go to as many as i could and i'd find just a couple that i liked and then you start seeing the same folks there mm -hmm. Th those are usually the full-timers and I would go with a purposeful question that I was going to ask. And it, I, I knew specifically who was going to be there. And I knew, so I'd have a couple of them. And I would, I'd have a one or two questions that I would ask. So I went there with a mission and I would ask them. And I, and I, I always warn people, when you do this, one or two questions. Like, you don't want to trap the host uh, for 45 minutes in a corner and talk their ear off. Cause you don't want them running from you later on ask one or two questions thank them and then just come back keep doing that and then you do that for 12 months like that's a wealth of information i did that to you i mean because uh, you y'all jet lending put on phenomenal events and i would just go just ask questions mm -hmm. here, here's a little trick I, I i've been doing for years i still do it today uh you know i ask for business cards and still the majority of people today have business cards i know like Alex here at Jet Lenny, he don't carry a business card. He wants to tap your phone. 
<laughs> it, 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 tapping the phone doesn't work what I'm about to tell you. I uh, After I talk to somebody for a few minutes, I get their business card. When I'm through talking to them, I rate them and I write it on the back of their card, a one star through a five star. So that because tomorrow morning I'm going to, I'm going to have 18 business cards in my pocket and I'm not going to remember necessarily who my five stars were unless I wrote it down. And so I, you know, I take my pen and I write one star through five stars on the back of the business card. And I'm so rating you talk to Eddie at a networking event. <laughs> yeah. Five, that's five stars. Somebody, I, this is somebody, this is a cat I want to talk to tomorrow and uh, do business with one star. That's, that's the time waster. You know, that's, that's the person I may not follow up with tomorrow. I do something similar, I but um, today. I do something similar. I fold the edge of the card. So I'll put it in my pocket and I fold the edge. And if I fold that edge, that's someone I want to follow up with, which a lot of times is a money partner or someone like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, something simple. I like it. Yeah, Chris, you're my only one star that made it big. Uh -oh. <laughs> All right. Hey, I defy the odds. <laughs> All right. Um, in these final few minutes, um, any advice on how to proceed going in on, on your first deal in this market just to mitigate risks? Um, and then we'll, we'll talk. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you can segment it both from a rental perspective to a, a flipping perspective. Yeah, before we get off, let's talk about the rates on the rental because I think that's a bigger impact to the overall audience than uh, than than the, the the rates are up both short term and long term. I mean, there's no need to ignore the elephant in the room, but I think long term is a bigger deal to you because you because you're going to hold it long term and rent it. You're you're locked into a into a rate that's going to hurt you on that cash flow. Short term, okay, you're going to be in that house two to eight months, two to ten months. So it's a lot less impact to you, in my opinion, a higher short-term rate than it is a higher long-term rate. So that's that's going to that's going to get after you pretty good. So both of them tell you you have to enter into the house and at, at a lower price point, so you can if it's a, if it's a short-term deal, so you can so you can make money when you sell it. If it's a long-term deal, so you can uh, at least break even um, on your cash flow. So you got to you know interest rates are you know, today on a long term, I just call it nine, you know, nine, nine and a half. You know, that's where you're going to be on a long term rate today. Well, you the only way to lower your monthly payments to buy it for less. It's the only way you can do it. So so that so that's 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 something you got to do. But, you know, I think back to your question. First of all, you cannot procrastinate and you can't delay. If you're going to get in, get in. Um, like I said earlier, you don't ever hear investors say, I wish I would have got in later, but you got to get educated. You know, the, you're, you're, you're in the audience today. Uh, maybe it's your first time to attend uh, an event like this. Uh, I com I commend you for being here. Uh, listen to the people that really know what they're talking about. Maybe don't take quite as much advice off of Facebook because 99% of the questions asked or answered on a, on a Facebook question are, are inaccurate, in my opinion. So you got to get start hanging out, getting to know the folks that know what they're doing, um, you know, and uh, get yourself get yourself educated, and 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 eventually you gotta you gotta jump in the water. Yep. So we had a you know I've got a whole list of other questions that uh, we just we're just not gonna have time to get to. Um, maybe we can. I know you used to do some classes on creative financing. You mentioned that's like a two day, two day topic. Um, also subject to, um, which I think subject to, and I don't know if you want to chime in just for a minute on subject to, I, th I think it's something that has a, with cash was so cheap, it mm -hmm. didn't make sense as much, but now it, it, it kind of does. And, and it actually could be a very lucrative strategy for those that, that know how to do it properly, uh, to control these mortgages. But, um, uh, there's there's a lot of opportunity. You just got to know how to do it. Yeah, property is a key word there. I mean, it's easy to jump in and do a deal subject to. It's 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 difficult and time consuming to do them right. Not your eyes and cross your T's. You know, regulatory uh, Texas Property Code a few years ago um, jumped in about re, you know reporting to the um, to the uh, to the lenders on an unpaid lien. So it's just a lot of things you got to know. Uh, I think sub two gets overused a little bit because people try to use sub two 
to make a bad deal a good deal. It, it doesn't work like that, in my opinion. A sub two will make a, a an average deal better. Mm-hmm. It makes a it, it makes a deal a little bit better. It, it doesn't turn a bad deal into a good deal. It's still not enough play, in the, yeah. most of the time. Love it. How can folks reach out to you? Uh, Eddie E D D I E at jetlending.com or info at jetlending.com is a probably the best and most efficient and get with us. Um, the phone number on the screen behind me is our office at 281-872-7800. But we're, 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 we're pretty easy to find and we're, we're pretty, we're pretty out there. We, we attend a lot of events. Uh, we're extremely active. And I'll, I'll say this, I, you know, you can, you can research us pretty heavily and our reputation is stellar in Texas while well, we take care of our clients. Are you, um, are we, are we going to see some more live events this fall? You know, maybe, you know, <laughs> uh, we're, so, we're so busy. Yeah. You know, we, we pulled back because, you know, these events take a, can take a large sum of capital. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we, 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 we postponed our event all a few months ago and the phone is ringing just as much as it was two or three months ago. The, 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 the investment business is, is still brisk. Yeah. You know, it's, you got to remember this, this is not mainstream real estate. The investment side, the distress, the distress side is always two to 8% of the overall market. Most years it's in that four to 6% range. And it's not going away because the market goes up or interest rates go up or interest rates come down and the market goes down. It doesn't work like that. We're always two to 8% of the overall real estate market. It's always there, always yeah. will be. And, and, and that's more encouragement for realtors out there that may be struggling with retail transactions following to learn the investment side because you're going to do one of two things. One, you could help some investors buy and sell houses. That's going to help your business. Or two, you might find a deal. <laughs> and uh-huh. and you should be investing um, if, if you're a realtor. You, you've got to invest as well. Well, a good investor is a repeat client. Yep, 100%. Where right, a, thank- is a, a client every seven years. <laughs> oh, that, that's 100 percent true 100 percent true well thank you so much eddie any, any final thoughts thanks for having me i always enjoy your show i always enjoy visiting with you your aggies got miami hurricanes this weekend i hope that works out well for all you aggies and uh hey we're always optimistic uh you never know what you get with our with our season we, we had a good game last week um yeah. here's the thought i'm ready for cooler weather 100 percent on that <laughs> All right. Thank you. We'll talk again soon. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Take care.